We're live? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a much anticipated book talk by Dr. Kia Melko Quick Hall. This afternoon, she will speak of her book, Naming a Black Transnational Feminist Framework. Many thanks to co sponsors, SIS Office of Research, SIS Ethnographies and Empire Research Cluster, SIS PhD Program. Anti-Racist Policy Center, and the AU Alumni Association. Dr. Hall is an alumna of our PhD program, graduated with distinction a few years, a few years back. En route to this, she earned an MA in our inter, international communication program. Prior to AU, Dr. Hall earned a Master's of Science in Computer and Informational Sciences from Temple University, and before that, her bachelor's, um, she graduated with a bachelor's from Sarah Lawrence College, concentration in math. Currently, she is a core faculty member at Fielding Graduate University's School of Leadership Studies, as well as a visiting scholar at Brandeis University's Women's Studies Research Center. She also, by the way, is an instructor at BU's Prison Education Program. Toward the end of her doctoral studies, Dr. Hall won the Association for Feminist Anthropology's Best Graduate Student Paper. And she was, her paper was also runner up for the Human Development and Capability Association's Cookley's Prize. A few years after graduation, she was a finalist for the National Women's Studies Association's first book prize. To be sure, we have with us this afternoon a very accomplished scholar and alumna. But her accomplishments don't really capture who she is and her character. Uh, why is this even important? When you read her book, you will understand why and how she endeavors to live an integrated whole life anchored in core values, especially one in which some of you have heard me articulate, quote, there is no me without us. How we go about building and strength strengthening the us is revealing of who we are as scholars and also notably as social beings embedded in the communities of which we're a part. I'd like to share with you a brief story, my apologies, Dr. Hall, here of a brief story of my journey, our journey, here and my journey together, in the hope that you, get a better, you have a better sense of who she is, her unabiding commitment to linking theory, practice, head and heart. And some of the seeds for her book were planted and germinated during this period. Over a decade ago, Dr. Hall enrolled in one of my graduate courses, now known as Intercultural Relations. Shortly after the semester began, I found her camped outside my office during weekly office hours. At that point, I was a faculty member in the AU Honors Program, located in the Honors Suite in Hearst Hall. She'd come to me, she'd come to me with questions about her doctoral studies work, especially questions and critiques of mainstream IR. We discussed theories, schools of thought, frameworks, arguments, even footnote content. On a weekly basis, I'd send her away with lists of readings from anthropology, sociology, philosophy, remember that, Dr. Hall? Political economy, history, feminist, and black studies. You, so you can imagine so much of which were missing from IR. It was as if there were no alternative ways of knowing and that large groups of peoples and their experiences, contributions didn't exist. And if they did, they were constructed as backdrops or props deployed to propel or naturalize certain narratives. Dr. Hall came back every single week having done the readings and wanting and asking even more questions. I remember saying to her that she had to build relationships with other faculty members I, you would agree with me, it's really good advice. But I also had an, alter, uh, an ulterior motive. I was going to preempt the question I knew would ultimately come. Besides, she witnessed how overloaded I was with teaching undergraduates and master's students, mentoring those who competed for national merit competitions, um, Truman, Rhodes, Marshall, and so forth, a ton of service, and of course, my research projects. So I finally said, no, I can't take you. I said it politely, I thought. 
After all, I had turned down other doctoral students for lack of time and energy to make yet another commitment. But she persisted. I didn't know then that perhaps she had been working on her own grand strategy to get me hooked into the weekly discussion, to engage me in analysis, sometimes debate, to make it hard enough for me to really say no. And she understood what I meant when I said to her she had to be two or three times better than the rest. That the road would be hard, much like Sisyphus pushing a boulder up a hill. And that during times of vulnerability, she'd question her self-worth and the value of her work. And to be sure, she understood uh, the concept and execution of objectivity that ends up obscuring values, choices, silencing voices, if not erasing experiences, perspectives, and lives. Her grand strategy worked because I came to realize over the course of the semester, inside and outside of the classroom, that I had before me a doctoral student who was hungry for knowledge, for support and guidance. She definitely was not afraid of hard work. One who was bold enough, I thought, and at ease with moving from and between the computational sciences and mainstream and critical IR. Kia knew that she would take on a predominantly white male field of study that at that time considered critical political economy scholars such as Randy Persaud and I, and me, as somewhat intellectual heretics, right, if you may, because we insisted on challenging the emerging field, not only from the class, but also from race or gender or intersectional perspectives. That is how our journey began together. She won a Fulbright scholarship to conduct ethnographic field research in Honduras looking at researching the Garifuna community and Araba production. By the way, she's produced a book of photography during her time there. It sits on my bookshelf in my office. So when we reopen again in person, please do feel free to come by and check it out. Dr. Hall immersed herself in the community. She sent regular field reports to me and I could document her growth. The questions she asked, her field observations and the constant juxtapositioning of empirics with theory. She witnessed firsthand the contradictory effects of Garifuna men taking over women's roles and responsibilities amid the broader context of racialized neoliberal development. It was there, I believe, that she firmly and fully grasped the indispensability of understanding, theorizing intersectionality as experienced by embodied lives. Dr. Hall was ahead of her time that is before the cultural turn in international political economy or the movement from quote, for quote unquote everyday international political economy or even embodied IR. It was there that the seats for the other four dimensions of a transnational black feminist framework were sown or nurtured even more. When she returned stateside amid winning several fellowships to write up her dissertation, Dr. Hall resumed her voluntary work teaching math to adults and kids in her community. She believed then, as she does now with her work, that, quote, there is no me without us, particularly without understanding, analyzing, working to change the lives of mar the marginalized and dispossessed. By that time, I was program director of the International Communication Program in SIS, and we'd meet regularly in my suite. Kia ended up coaching our, our graduate and undergraduate students throughout their most dreadful degree requirement, statistics or research methods. She was a constant presence in the suite and helped us build community. As I helped her with revising her dissertation chapters, challenging her on her arguments, she in turn helped me with my third book with making sense of field research, poking holes in framework, preparing tables and graphics. So my journey with Kia Melko Quick Hall reminded, taught and reminded me two very important things. One is that the student selects the teacher. As the relationship builds, the roles can be and are reversed in some of the most empowering ways. Two, as some of you already know, 
when you take on the responsibility of for walking with a student on a journey, on her journey, from one point to another, go ahead and walk it to the fullest. Be there every step of the way. It is not just an academic intellectual relationship. It can be when you allow a very rich, mutually beneficial, humanity affirming one. And be, before you know it, they will go on to write and tell stories that can do and help change how we make or give sense to the world, live our lives in all the ways that benefit self and other, in the quest to bring about a more equitable community, world, and planet. So welcome home, Dr. Hall. It is always a pleasure for me to see you. Thank you all for coming, for attending this event. And I'll now turn the floor over to, do to Dr. Jordana Matlin and Dr. Garrett Grady Lovelace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Chen. Um, that, was, that was really a wonderful kind of tour of, of a journey that uh, Dr. Hall took in the, the in SIS, I think before I arrived, but um, this is really exciting to, to know how the, the impact that you had and, and certainly are continuing to have on the people that you are now um, leading and advising and, and guiding. Um, so my name is Jordana Matlon and I am co-founder and co-lead with Dr. Garrett Grady Lovelace of the Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster, um, SIS Research Cluster. Garrett and I are delighted to welcome you to our first Ethnographies of Empire event of the 2021 academic year and our fourth year as a research cluster. The Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster provides an intellectual space for SIS scholars who use ethnography, critical theory, and historical research to interrogate structures of domination rooted in contemporary iterations and legacies of empire. With the breadth of our disciplinary and regional expertise, we advance theories of how empire is reproduced and the knowledge power relationship therein, how global inequalities along the lines of race, gender, class, nation, and beyond are perpetuated, and how empire's formations are contested in comparative and relational perspective. As ethnographers, we approach these topics from the bottom up, examining abstractions such as the state, governance, and nature society relations and their concrete and messy realities to offer important takes on topics in international relations and to interrupt standard narratives within foreign policy circles. The Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster provides a forum for the conversations currently happening on campus and beyond concerning the politics of identity and difference coloniality and decoloniality, and anti-racism. We could not be more excited then to launch a new year of cluster events with this talk from SIS alum, Dr. K. Melker Quick Hall. Thank you, Dr. Hall, for joining us today. Great thanks also to our co-sponsors, the SIS PhD program, the SIS Office of Research, and American University's Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. And I will hand the virtual floor over to um, Garrett, my, my co-lead of the cluster. Thank you so much, Dean Chin and for Professor Matlon. Um, very quickly to build off of Jordana's points, um, we heartily welcome everyone here for joining us. We heartily welcome, we are so honored to be hosting Dr. Kia Melkor Quick Call, who we are proud is an SIS PhD alum. This is a book talk for her brand new book, obviously, Naming a Transnational Black Feminist Framework, Writing in Darkness. It is a gem. It is a pivotal book that is loaded with insights that are born of deep research and analysis and synthesis um, with such lines as, a transnational Black feminist framework aims to correct the erasures or willful amnesia that have contributed to the development of an IR discipline that is wholly inadequate for discussing the diverse realities of the world or even the diverse realities of the so-called West. This is a grave and groundbreaking book. And so we're very honored um, to be welcoming its author, Dr. Hall, to be joining us today for a conversation. After about a half an hour of her presentation, we open up the floor to two discussants, esteemed Professor Randy Persaud and Dr. Rachel Watkins, who were on Melkor's um, doctoral committee. 
And then we open up the floor for questions from the audience. In the meantime, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box and we will be rolling through these and trying to get as many to Dr. Hall as possible. Of course, anything disrespectful we delete and remove. Um, we're here in, a, in an environment of trust and respect and bravely engaging the provocative and timely and overdue ideas that have been put forth in this book. So, um, and then a quick, um, just some images of things that are happening up uh, in, in, the, in the near future. Um, the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center has a very exciting event um, next week on uh, September 30th, Nourishing Black Futures, Setting an Anti-Racist Agenda on Food Justice and Black Maternal Health. This actually pertains to the reproductive justice and food sovereignty theses that culminate this book, uh, Dr. Hall's new areas of research. And then we also, moving forward with the Ethnographies of Research Cluster, Ethnographies of Empire, we have a meet and greet on Monday, the 28th of September. Please join us for that. And then we have a talk with Dr. Naomi Hossein on bear life in 1970s Bangladesh, the storm, the beetle, and Henry Kissinger about the empire of food aid. And then a talk with Dr. Carol Gallagher from anti-government to pro-government, tracking changes in the militia movement over time all very timely and all building off of some of the important anti-racist and feminist work that Dr. Hall has put forth in her book. So without any further ado, welcome. Thank you so much um, for, the, for the lovely introduction and the story. Um, and, and I'm so I'm excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen and, and ultimately try to spend not as much time presenting as, as having a conversation with you all. Um, I, I want very much for this to be an opportunity for us to engage the ideas in the book. And so with that, I'm going to, going to jump right in. As a popular educator who works for a university right now, <laughs> there is something quite uncomfortable about the lack of interaction embedded in a webinar technology designed to prevent interruption and render my audience invisible. In a Frontiers article, I've written about the potential of technology in black feminist world that is designed with attention to cultural norms of engagement, such as call and response and other forms of audience participation. However, today on this virtual pedestal, because I cannot interact with you in the ways that I would if we were in person, I will be asking questions throughout the presentation. These are not rhetorical questions. After discussing comments, once the floor has been opened, I hope that you will respond to these queries, speak your concerns, and join the conversation. On this first slide, you can see an outline of my talk, which will focus on the five guiding principles of a transnational black feminist framework. My greatest aspiration for this book is that it rise to the level of poetry, not the kind of poetry that is superfluous, but the kind that is central to envisioning alternative futures. Audre Lorde wrote about this kind of poetry in an essay entitled, Poetry is Not a Luxury, open quote. For women then, Poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. The farthest horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. If what we need to dream, to move our spirits most deeply and directly toward and through promise is discounted as a luxury, then we give up the core, the fountain of our power, our womanness. We give up the future of our worlds." End quote. My book seeks to name something. It is a collective thing without name that is already felt. The book represents the beginning of its birth to the black feminist body. That black feminist body is dark, ancient, and deep. In this sense, 
Darkness should be seen as a generative source for creative production, a womb for the birthing of things yet to be named. I have named the object being birthed as a transnational black feminist framework because naming is an important part of welcoming new beings or ontologies into worlds. This particular name honors blackness, not as the only generative source for the framework but as the end of a color spectrum so reviled in a white supremacist framework that it must be named in any radically liberatory response. Transnationalism is centered as a paradigm that cuts across the hierarchies of the international or governmental, often out of reach for the most marginalized among us. Black feminism is the living, breathing body giving birth to this framework living in feminist legacies. At American University, my dissertation project was nurtured by a committee of women of color chaired by Christine Chen and including Lubna Scalihana, Rachel Watkins and Consuelo Hernandez. Chen, a scholar of international political economy who dared to discuss cosmopolitan sex workers in a way that highlights the agency of women, transnational migrant labor, and creative repression of states, encouraged me to be unflinching in my reckoning with IR's racist and patriarchal culture. Skali Hanna, a scholar of international development and communications who has given rare and overdue credit to youth in their movements, insisted that I make clear my unique scholarly voice and contribution. Watkins, a black feminist and biocultural anthropologist has inspired me to defy disciplinary boundaries from the moment I took her anthropology course that included fictional texts to her ongoing cutting edge research on race biology and culture, which connects social theory and human biology. Hernandez, a Spanish language and Latin American literature scholar who is an award-winning poet reminded me that at its best, our work should connect to community and contribute to art. I'm indebted to the powerful example of these scholars who mentored me. Guiding principles of a TBF framework. Intersectionality. Intersectionality insists on complicating a one note story, a one drop ruling. Garifuna society is black, indigenous, matrifocal, Latin American and transnational. It is an ethnic group with its origins on the island of St. Vincent in the Western hemisphere. The ancestral Garifuna communities of Honduras where I did research are traditional and contemporary, developed and developing. They, are also, they also embody alternatives to development concocting herbal remedies rooted in indigenous medicinal knowledge in order to reduce the effects of a global health pandemic while advocating for their rights to land and sea through inter-American courts. The discipline of international relations has a lot to learn from the multiply marginalized communities that are often erased in a narrow focus on the governments that alternate between neglecting and repressing these communities. I will not participate in my own erasure. Our lives matter. Black lives matter. When I visited the School of International Service website yesterday, I noticed a statement on diversity and inclusion. Feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed wrote, open quote, diversity is often used as a shorthand for inclusion, as a happy point of intersectionality, a point where lines meet where intersectionality becomes a happy point, the feminist of color critique is obscured. All differences matter under this view, yet diversity in the policy world still tends to be associated with race. The association is sticky, which means the tendency is reproduced by not being made explicit." End quote. When I look at the statement posted on the website, I notice the word race never appears. A feminist of color critique is obscured in race not being made explicit. Blackness is erased. What is IR learning from the movement for black lives? Scholar activism. Our research is not neutral. 
and any such pretense only reveals one's ignorance regarding institutional power. Since earning my doctorate, I am in a position to advocate for the rights of Garifuna migrants caught up in the U.S. court system. I have become an expert on Honduras' Garifuna community in a system that excludes community members from being experts on their own experience. My degree from a white private US-based university allows me to intervene on behalf of the people who gifted me the substance of my dissertation. There are too many opportunities for betrayal in this system where my voice is louder than hundreds of Garifuna, of Honduran Garifuna asylum-seeking refugees because of my US citizenship, my white university degree, my English language communication. Using my scholar status to intervene is an essential even if inadequate response to the gay Funa migrants who are escaping violent realities fueled by U.S. deportation policies and U.S. financial support of increased Honduran government militarization. Certainly, the distorted maps that enlarge the U.S. and shrink the rest of the world contribute to the delusion that the lives we live in the U.S. are beyond the scope of international relations somehow detached from the material violence of current imperial and neoliberal projects. IR scholars are not innocent. We are either complicit or resisting. The academy has been central to the construction and rationalization of a white supremacist patriarchal state. A transparent IR education makes students aware of the ongoing struggle over ideas that become policies and laws against which many communities fight for their very existence. Are IR scholars in training learning about the material and sometimes deadly implications of inattention to the rights of those communities marginalized within states and across states? Solidarity. I am a native daughter of Chocolate City, a nickname given to a majority black Washington DC in the 70s. My parents met at and graduated from the historically black Howard University. Roots Activity Learning Center and Afrocentric Independent School was where I started my education. And in order to graduate from school without walls, I had to take a DC history course. American University sits on top of my home. The School of International Service teaches about democracy and statehood while occupying a city where black women such as me come to age without any congressional voting representation. Solidarity requires deep commitments to principles espoused across difference. It is neither easy nor convenient. The School of International Service and American University more broadly make decisions every day about commitments to various partners Students, staff, and faculty should be aware of those commitments. Certainly, I hope those commitments would include basic democratic rights for people born in the nation's capital. Whether the school stands in solidarity with the democratic rights of the residents of the city it occupies or not, this distinctive feature of the country should certainly be included in any discussions of how we are to understand the United States and its racist leg legacy evident in domestic and foreign policies and practices. How are we to classify such states that dis disenfranchise residents of their own capitals, even while espousing democratic values? Attention to borders, boundaries. Chicana feminist Gloria Anzaldúa introduced the idea of borderlands that exist, open quote, wherever two or more cultures edge each other, where people of different races occupy the same territory, where under, lower, middle, and upper classes touch, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy, end quote. She wrote, open quote, Borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its residents." End quote. For many borderlands residents, 
an international perspective and its focus on national governments and its reification of colonizing separations is not simply incomplete, it is a distortion of our lived realities. My manuscript, Privileges, Transnational Solidarities and Activism that Challenge Colonial Borders as well as Disciplinary Boundaries. How could and should we redraw our maps to take into account indigenous territories and shared land stewardship? What does IR need to learn from the disciplines of geography, anthropology, and sociology? Radically transparent author positionality. American University School of International Service awarded me a doctorate and my dissertation is a form of extraction from a black indigenous community filtered through a system that does not allow for proper recognition, citation of community knowledge. I have some found memories of my time at American University that include the following interactions. Interactions with Melissa Becker and Mary Mintz and other Bender Library staff, Julie Murtis and the Summer Human Rights Institute, Fanta Ah, who I came to know through the Sister Mentors Dis Dissertation Support Group, Paula Warwick and the Office of Merit Awards, and countless others. At the same time, I experienced the challenging expulsion and ejection of female colleagues and mentors in an environment where pregnancy can be defined as illness, a soft tone seen as a lack of intellectual acuity, and a woman's age treated as a liability. My relationship with the university where I received an award for outstanding scholarship is complicated, shaped by racist, patriarchal, and colonial encounters. Although geographically close to Howard University, where former American University Professor Clarence Lusane currently teaches, it is in many ways distant. I studied at a school of international service that sits atop Chocolate City but failed to highlight the important legacies of Black feminists generally, and specifically the contributions of Black feminist anthropologists to international and transnational studies. It is a tense and tenuous relationship that garners this audience on the heels of my first manuscript. I sit here alone on a stage, balanced on the back of others, made possible by a deceptively single authored manuscript that is mostly made possible by the intellectual spaces carved out by transnational feminists of color and home places cultivated by black women. Honoring the memory and living legacies of black women. It is a horrible gift to be at this moment, to be living at this moment when queer black feminist le living legacies are the driving force behind a movement for black lives. Too often black people die young. It is important to honor black life and legacy. Recently, one of the black indigenous Garifuna women who taught me about the culture passed away. Her name is Beatrice Avila Bernardes. She is pictured here. When I was in Honduras several years ago, I visited her and she, took, she showed me that she still had copies of all of my interim reports to the community. The next time I go to Honduras, there will be fewer people for me to visit. Blame it on COVID. Blame it on US-backed state-sanctioned violence that recently disappeared five Gary Funa men. Blame it on unnecessary poverty. Blame it on the intertwined systems of oppression that allow all of that to happen in the name of neoliberal development and capitalist profit. Black women often die too young. My friend and American University alumna, Monica Wells Kasura, who wrote about black homeschooling families in Canada after doing research funded by a Fulbright grant, died in her 40s. I honor her and so many others who created the conditions that have shaped my life and work. disappearing into the underground. Stefano Harney and Fred Moten wrote about the complicated relationship of the subversive intellectual 
to the university under the heading, the only possible relationship to the university today is a criminal one, open quote. But certainly, this much is true in the United States. It cannot be denied that the university is a place of refuge and it cannot be accepted that the university is a place of enlightenment. In the face of these conditions, one can only sneak into the university and steal what one can to abuse its hospitality despite its mission to join its refugee colony, its gypsy encampment, to be in but not of. This is the path of, path of the subversive intellectual in the modern university. After all, the subversive intellectual came under false pretenses with bad documents out of love. Her labor is as necessary as it is unwelcome. The university needs what she bears but cannot bear what she brings and on top of all that she disappears. She disappears into the underground, the down low, low down maroon community of the university into the under commons of enlightenment where the work gets done, where the work gets subverted, where the revolution is still black, still strong, end quote. I do not want this book to be judged by professional association awards or scholarly critique. Instead, I hope it will be measured by its capacity to move forward transnational solidarity work that will advance liberation struggle. The manuscript honors the spirit of networks powered by women of color, networks designed to nourish our communities and expand life's options. It is humbly written in solidarity, incomplete in awaiting the chorus of voices that might accompany it. May it inspire in the spirit of a June Jordan poem, a Lorraine Hansberry play, a Sweet Honey in the Rock song, an Octavia Butler story. May it be recorded as part of the soundtrack of the freedom movement. Dangerous art. I began with an Audre Lorde point, quote about poetry not being a luxury and I'll end with a quote from Haitian American novelist Edwidge Danticat about creativity. Open quote, create dangerously for people who read dangerously. This is what I've always thought it meant to be a writer. Writing, knowing in part that no matter how trivial your words may seem, someday, somewhere, someone may risk his or her life to read them, end quote. The transnational black feminist framework is an international relations intervention that writes black feminist theory and practice into a white patriarchal canon by focusing on the principles of intersectionality, scholar activism, solidarity, attention to borders, boundaries, and radically transparent author positionality. The transnational black feminist framework can and should be used by other academics and outside the academy as it captures common themes in the work of black women and other women of color, especially transnational feminist. Do the scholarship, but focus on freedom, attending to how our scholarly projects have the potential to move us toward liberation, engaging the living legacies of those communities that have nurtured the diverse people we are. Creating dangerously is an art. This art is not a luxury and our futures are on the line. I want to Thank you for this opportunity to speak directly to an IR audience. If you want to connect further with me or my work, please visit www.writingindarkness.org. Um, Routledge sells the book for $140, um, but you can use the American U discount code um, to subscribe to the Transnational Black Feminist series for $150, which includes an autographed copy of the book and access to a year's worth of monthly conversations with Black feminist artists and activists discussing the five transnational Black feminist guiding principles. Past featured guests have included Maori Holmes of Philly-based Black Star Film Festival, and Candace Montgomery of the Minneapolis-based Black Visions Collective. Our next guest will be vocalist, composer, and teacher Nadelka Prescott this Saturday, September 26 at 1 p.m. Eastern. The series includes a broad range of Black feminist voices who have agreed to engage me in a conversation about their work and the usefulness of a transnational Black feminist framework for understanding our interconnected lives. The tagline for the series is, just as peace is more than the absence of war and freedom is more than the absence of enslavement, 
Black lives are so much more than the absence of Black death. Every time I give a talk about this book, it is different than the previous talk because I am growing and learning with a community of people who are trying to thrive together. Of course, I hope that you will join me in engaging these conversations about our interdependent lives. I wanna also thank, thank the group of people who helped to organize this event, which began with Boaz at Zilli purchasing an autographed copy of my book for SIS and expanded to conversations with Randy Prasad, who wrote an endorsement for the book. I'm appreciative of the ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster that hosted this event, um, especially Garrett Brady Lovelace and Jordana Matlon. As always, I know there are a number of people working behind the scenes and making this kind of event possible. Um, and I wanna acknowledge the, the, port, the support of Christiana Kasner and Asha Couture, as well as others whose names I do not know and have unintentionally omitted um, I won't read through all of the acknowledgments listed here. Um, I just want to thank you again for your time. And I hope that you know how grateful I am to have had this opportunity to share my work. I look forward to our discussion. I'm gonna stop sharing. Hi, I think if it's okay, Grady, I'll just dive right in. Okay, so thank you so much, Melker, for that talk and congratulations on this fantastic book. 10 years ago, I cannot even believe it. It was 10 years ago this May, um, I had the pleasure of closing out a class uh, as a professor of the Race, Gender, and Social Justice Seminar was connected to a concentration that our department used to have. So Kia contacted me the previous fall about enrolling in the class, which she did. And the class uh, was focused on critical race theory. And so in addition to canonical work in the field, we examined foundational and emergent concepts through reading work produced by anthropologists, especially black feminist anthropologists, and close readings of novels, essays, and memoirs. And our goal in this space was to examine constructions of gender, racial, and national identities as depicted in fiction <clears throat> and nonfiction, to look at the theoretical treatment of relationships between citizenship, race, gender, class, sexuality, and ethnicity. And I'll make a point to say that my stage of growth at that point was such that I unfortunately did not include ability. And the last goal was to examine the lived experiences of being situated within these intersections and constructions. I'm really glad to have played a role in developing Melker's project bringing together ethnography, Black feminist praxis, and IR. But as Christine pointed out, Kia came here ahead of her time. We had to catch up with her. And this is because Melker's work also reflects a life history and a lineage, which Christine spoke of at the beginning, grounded in cultural and intellectual production, scholar activism, honoring Black life, Black feminist praxis that's grounded in that, that proverb that was mentioned earlier, there's no me without us. These people, I remember uh, Melkor, I mean, Lynn Freeman, you know, all of these people came and surrounded her on the day of her dissertation defense, as they should have, because they were a part of the birth of this book. And so, while I know that we all have a lot to celebrate here at AU in terms of the training that we played a part in, um, in Melker's training, but what we really need to be celebrating is this demonstration of the intellectual benefit of decolonized spaces 
in which people can bring their whole selves to the table. It benefits all of us. And so in addition to being something that we should celebrate, we also need to take it as a challenge to keep moving forward toward decolonization and making that a normal part of doing what we do on campus and elsewhere. And with that said, this is making me think that our anthropology department needs to think about bringing back the race, gender, and social justice concentration. Um, I want to thank Garrett and Jordana for their leadership as co-chairs of the Ethnographies of Empires Cluster, um, supporting us in the celebration and the challenge. And I will stop there. Okay, I guess I'm up next, yes? Okay, well, um, Melkar, I mean, um, if you wanted this book to be read as poetry, um, I can tell you that you delivered it in poetry. And by so doing, there's a really important lesson there in that it's about the limits of social science, um, which seeks to endlessly to make generalizations which turn into abstractions and then only to graduate in concentric circles away from the body, from the physical body. And that eternal body that nourishes all that should be treasured, that is the family. And um, so I listened uh, to, I listened with great intent. I think what you did here is nothing less than a systematic assault, not only on international relations as a discipline, but from the places that propound to teach the transformation of that discipline, including where you wrote your dissertation. I, I can say that it takes an enormous amount of courage to do that, especially when one is speaking from the platform, right? that you're critiquing and you've done it and you did it brilliantly. Um, it also tells me something as a, as a teacher and instructor um, about how to approach those students who come in from backgrounds that might not necessarily have the disciplinary lingo as it were, all of the catchphrases and versed in all of the writers from Thucydides to Alexander went, but they do have a passion for change and transformation. And I think you brought that and you have very much actually um, done that. I think it's already done. Um, your critique, uh, your engagement with the existing literature, uh, I found it really refreshing because you did not go through the predictable path of reviewing from Thucydides to Wentz, but you took uh, you took an approach that is really worth considering of how to be epistemologically concrehegemonic. And and what you did, you you started out, you reviewed Acharya's Global IR and the literature on race and racism and the literature on white feminism. And notwithstanding their contributions, you decided uh, to an accumulative kind of way to build on it. Uh, like Global IR, which attempts to displace, not to add to um, mainstream hegemonic IR, or race and IR, and I was delighted to see you made full use of Shankaran Krishna's idea of abstraction and the, the violence that abstractionism fosters, defends, and reproduces. And white feminism, the conditions of emergence of the full field thesis of the glass ceiling, a kind of a glass ceiling liberalism, uh, notwithstanding its contributions, the type of fault lines that has always characterized it. 
and then you go on to do something really bold by introducing uh, categories that will house you know the infrastructure of your work and and from there begin to launch a systematic interrogation based upon what I really like about this, I've never seen it written before, a place-based transnationalism. And I find that really fascinating because transnationalism in some sense is always taken to be, to go beyond national sovereignty and to go beyond state-centric analyses. But you assume that those are categories to go beyond. And I think what you did here to show that there's no contradiction between a place-based geography of the political and the transnational efforts of subverting those places where domination, both from inside and from afar, have always haunted people's lives. I think you did that powerfully. Um, you know, good books always pose difficult questions. And your book is no different, and so therefore, um, I do have a few comments that I want to throw out for purposes of discussion. And the biggest one really is this. And I know Jordana and Garrett Grady and people in EOE, we have talked about this before and I, I want to raise it with you. Um, I've always felt that the wildest form, the most radical form of counter-hegemonic practice is to leave people alone. And this is the question I want to ask you. Why do we need to bring people from the margin to the center? When in fact, I want to get them away from this center which has haunted their lives for so long. The center is always hegemonic. It's the axis of domination it provides all the technologies, right? That, that retail domination in the form of knowledge. So I want to ask you that, is that, um, is there something else to be done other than to, to, to bring those at the margins who have been pushed out of the margins and have found a way to sustain themselves with dignity? Because more than anything else, this is about dignity, not development. And they have found a way to do it in their own way making cassava bread and living as families, both nuclear and otherwise. Shouldn't be, shouldn't the relations of force be directed in the opposite direction? That, that's my first question. And the second question is about, um, um, and, and it's about activism. You know, uh, uh, I had the great opportunity once of meeting CLR James um, whilst I was still a graduate student. And uh, I'm from where Walter Rodney is from, Guyana. And as you know, Walter Rodney was assassinated. And um, we always wanted to know what would be James's reaction to Walter Rodney's assassination. And the answer he gave the audience was astounding. He said Rodney had no business doing what he was doing. That he was a writer and what he would have contributed to the global struggle for emancipation would have been as important. That kind of activism is also a kind of activism. Writing is a form of activism. What you have written is already a form of activism. What you said today is a form of activism. Um, and so I wonder to what extent we need to sort of, you know, defetishize uh, activism, which is almost always reduced to being active on the ground, doing something that is observable with the naked eye. Um, I say so because the activism dimension of your scholarship is serious in the sense that what we write about, the questions we pose and want to answer, if they get too far away from the lives that we think that we are writing about, and oftentimes, and with good reason, 
accord ourselves the right to participate in the emancipatory struggle. If you get too far away, you cannot do that. But where's the balance? What is the balance? Um, and I'd very much like to hear your thoughts on this, to what extent we need to theorize awesome. activism more. Yes, I'm, and I, I better leave it there, yeah. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for the questions because I really meant what I said at the end about each time I give this talk, it's different. And so because it's the first time I've given a talk in DC, this is the first time I've given that cho chocolate city piece. And, and people will often look for, for me to read, you know, to, to read pieces of the book, but, but the book is written so that other people can read it, right? Like that's the stable part, but this engagement for me is why I do the talks at all. So, so first of all, please know how grateful I am for the questions. Leaving people alone. Not everybody wants to be left alone. And I want to, I, I want to say that I'm not, um, I, I don't get to decide what people want. But I do get to be in conversation with people who might notice that it seems like I got an uneven share of things. And they can ask me to spread out some of what I ended up with. And they could be right, especially when, they, when I'm sitting on stolen land. And so if, the, if somebody comes to me, I'm on stolen land, they say, you shouldn't have this piece. I say, we, I should be working on their behalf <laughs> to, to, sh to shift things. So, so I, I, I wanna say that I, it's really important to understand that I am not telling people what they should want. I don't do that. Um, it, and, and I am also, be, because you use the learn, language about core and periphery, I'm challenging the mappings. I, I'm, I'm saying that I, I won't agree to, to where we put people in that mapping if that's the only one. I think that we have to have multiple mappings um, and, and, and overlapping mappings. The, the idea, I, I don't, people mean different things when they say core and we can settle on some ideas. I mean, we, we could talk about I don't know, GDP, we could talk about phone lines. I mean, we could talk about human rights, you know, whatever we pick, right? It's, you know, uh, but certainly given the moral location of this country currently, I, I think that, that, that we have some real questions about what's the most important mapping at any given moment. <laughs> when, we, when we look at people's ability to participate in a, a a kind of, uh, for, for states to act in ways that respond to the importance of humanity wherever it is on the globe. If I, if I do a ranking based on that, I think we might have to, we might have to shift who we, who we normally might think of as sort of being in the, in the core and the periphery, but even to understand how we might map this place we might, you know, we might call the United States. I think we first have to draw a more honest map. I mean, uh, you know, if, 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 if you go into a grade school in the United States, you would think that there are no indigenous nations here. H how, is, how is that possible? I mean, is, it, is something, I mean, I, not even the federally recognized nations are listed on most of the maps in the grade school. What sense does that make? So I'm not, we can't talk about, you know, sort of challenge a, a map that starts off as a lie, right? And, and then talk about people wanting to move into a center that is a lie to begin with. So I think that, I think that, we, I think that we have to begin at the, at the question of the, of the mapping and initially and understand that, that we, whoever we decide we are in any given moment, don't get to tell other people what they, can, what they want and what they want to advocate for. Which leads to the second, second question about activism. And I want to clarify that the principle that I, that I use is scholar activism, one word. And I, and, I, and I make, part of the reason why I put intersectionality first is because it's really important to understand how I'm using that in a way that is not additive, but is in fact intersectional. I am saying that if you put a bunch of money into some university to get a degree, you're gonna have to recognize 
what kind of power and privilege that gives you. So I'm talking to all the other people who got PhDs out of this university and others. I am calling us out. <laughs> I am saying that I get to be an expert on people's lives after spending, what? I mean, if I do the long estimation, seven, eight years on it. <laughs> I mean, and I'm counting not just the time I was in school, but you know, let's say I read a couple of books before and after. I mean, that, that is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, they can't, you know, the people, the, the relationship, the power relationships have to be reckoned with in a way that people who go through this path to becoming a scholar have to be honest about how they're participating, participating in institutional power and the material implications of that communities on communities all over. And, and I also want to say that part of the reason why, why I do it in that way is because by the time someone has become a scholar, they also, um, there's some really clear things that they can do. And, and often when people talk about activism separately, and, and I'm really glad um, Dr. Watkins talked about ableism, because often Activism is talked about in a very ableist way. I mean, I, t I have had so many conversations with, with people who feel really awful because they haven't been hitting the streets. And at, I'm a caregiver for a 99-year-old African-American woman. You won't find me out in these streets. I can't, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't risk killing my grandmother. And, and, and like my responsibilities and, and everybody, and I, and I don't have to give that excuse. I mean, we all have to decide what and where we, where we step in and where we can, but I'm saying at the very least, you have to do it in the place where you have the most power. Otherwise it's a cop out. You can't go and fight kids on the playground. I need you to play with grownups. I need you to interact with people from the location where you have the most power. And so, and so for the activism piece, when I, when I think about that, I'm calling out scholar activists, in particular, people who have, who have uh, terminal degrees. And I also want to say about the, is it our business? I'm saying the business of freedom is all of our business. And that's what I'm advocating for. Thank you. <laughs> Very rich conversation. Um, lots of questions. They're so good. I'm going to read a few and then give them to you, Dr. Hall. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on the previous comments to say, this is an autoethnography of the empire of academia and the methodological interventions and insights are so powerful on page 18 in making the positionality and political allegiances of the scholar visible. It renders the researcher and the researched equitably vulnerable. It's just such a powerful set of insights about feminist, feminist methodology operationalized in action. Um, and then just very quickly on page 113, there is a cruel irony in the fact that the relatively new IR discipline is constructed in a way that removes from you entirely First Nations. And this is such also a very powerful intervention in NIR. Not only are the dominant IR traditions state-centric, in ways that render transnational groups invisible, they are also specifically inept at acknowledging indigenous ways of being or geographies. So there's so much packed into this book that actually the first question is, it's $140. I'll just throw that out there. Rutledge, it's the broader system, but this book kind of- And I didn't even know it was gonna be that much when I did it. I mean, when I, I so, so I just really quickly. So the reason why I am, I created a website and I'm, and I'm selling books on my website for $100 instead of the 140 is because I couldn't, I couldn't go to sleep the night after it was published and I realized that it cost that much. So I have a bunch of boxes of books that I was planning on selling out my outside of my trunk, you know, like the way that the many people, it's like everybody in my family was going to have some, and now none of us are interacting with people. So the books that I am selling to you, autograph copies, are because, one, I know that I have to give away at least 50 and to the community, to the community that gave me the, the, the content for the degree. But the second thing is that how in good conscience could any publisher charge that much money for a book that has anything about scholar activism? It's a joke. And it's the Academy. <laughs> well, we can help circulate it because it needs to be circulated far and wide. Um, so 
a few questions. Um, so Dr. Spike Peterson writes, I just want to say, direct quote, how much I appreciate the presentation you just gave, your extraordinary articulation of impossibly complex and challenging arguments, observations, insights, experience, wisdom, and your courage speaking critique, where it is rarely welcome, and for that reason, especially needed. So that's I'm a fan. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. <laughs> I appreciate the comments. That means a lot. Um, and then the next one is um, last Friday, and this is almost, but anyway, we'll bring it in. Um, in a letter from the OMB, told all executive branch agencies to identify any spending related to training on critical race theory, white privilege, or any of the theory that posits that the U.S. or any race or ethnicity is quote inherently racist or evil, um, be unfunded, be defunded. What are your thoughts on this? How can we address the cases of violence and discrimination that are rampant? Um, when our highest positions in our land do not recognize its roots or even allow those roots to be discussed. This is why a remapping is necessary, because it's clear that being in the president's office doesn't, doesn't have the, the kind of status that people might as associate with, that it doesn't have the kind of, it, it doesn't require the kind of integrity that we might imagine that it it should require. I mean, the reality is that the base comments that are coming out of that office, we should, we, we should be spending our time elsewhere. I mean, I don't, you know, it, 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 it's not a good use of, <laughs> use of our time. I encourage folks to vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, next question. Um, so this project is from Diana especially with the facets on the Garifuna Comunidad in Honduras, IR, et cetera, are very compelling in light of academia's colonialist patriarchal systems and structures. I'm curious if there are interrelationships with AU, Center for Latino and Latin American, Latin American Latino Studies Center, and their Latin American research, and secondly, how AU's academia at large can further anti-colonialist perspectives and counter the lack of Afro-Latin American and gender experiences in AU's work. So, and, I, and maybe someone here can speak more about the institutions at American University, but, but I just want to second the idea that Afro-Latinidad and, and, and Afro-Indigeneity need to be discussed more often in, in, in our academic spaces. Too often I hear people talking about Black or Indigenous and not attending to Black and Indigenous. I mean, it, 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 it just... Um, I, 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 I mean, and even the idea that people are, have so much trouble with that speaks to where people are willing to acknowledge indigenous, in, indigeneity as an actual idea, right? Because when we think about the continent of Africa, right? When we think about parts of South America, I mean, it's full of indigenous folks, you know, people who were there before these states were drawn, right? Autochthonous people, it, you know, in, in, in anthropology, right? And, and so I think that it's really important to have those conversations and to and to to be able to have them in an intersectional framework that doesn't that doesn't do this either or um, you know kind of we could talk about this and this but we have to find people who are mutually exclusive in order to engage the conversations. I think it's really important that those conversations about people who are again. Uh, Afro-Latino, Afro Afro-Latinx, Afro-Latinidad, um, to have many more of those conversations and about Black indigeneity. Thank you. And she just wrote also to say she's the chair of AU's Latino Alumni Alliance. So she's asking in a very kind of constructive generative way. Yeah. Um, I, also, someone just wrote Shahrazadeh Jafari. Dr. Hall just dropped the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Love you, Shahrazad. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Shout out to my cohort. I don't want to say that we were the best cohort, but we were really, I really enjoyed us. <laughs> um, Karen Ant Edwards says, I appreciate Dr. K's narrative about the power dynamic as it pertains to her comment on expertise. Seven years as a scholar doesn't really make you an expert on the lives of others. That was powerful. Another comment. And then um, Megan Shang says, as a current PhD SIS student with intersectional identities, I'm touched to see this conversation take place. The transnational black feminist framework provides space for more identities to be recognized. What is your advice for those like me that strive to address these identities historically missed from IR like disability? 
I mean, I, I, I think that um, it was interesting because when um, Dr. Chen was talking earlier about, you know, she'd give me this stuff and I would go away and I would come back and, and I initially thought I just, I wasn't, I was missing it. I was, th you know, and so, and so finally, after probably months, I, I remember one time coming into her office and saying, Dr. Chen, I, I, ha I haven't been able to find the black feminist camp in IR. Like what, you know, I thought, you know, I thought she wanted me to find it on my own, but I kept on coming back and I was like, what, I don't see the black feminist camp here. And and she, and she initially laughed. I don't know if you remember this, but it, and I was and I was like, "Oh my goodness, am I not looking hard enough?" And she was like, "No, it's not. You know, it's not there." And so, I think that part of this creating a generative space where where people are able to have conversations that represent their lived realities is a really important part of it. I I think that. I don't have, you know, I don't have the, the, the specific advice on that, but just to, to, to bring it in as you live it, to, to write it in and to insist that you be heard and you be included in, in the literature, in this scholarship, to, to come back each time and, and insist in all of the locations where you could be. Because, um, you know, if, if we don't do that, it's not just... People will sometimes think of it as self-indulgent, but it is not that. It, it is that everything, the scholarship is better if we are able to talk about where it does or doesn't include us. And so, so I mean, I, I think that my, my main advice is just to persist, to persist and insist on your inclusion, how, whatever form that takes, both in content and in structure. That's great. And there's three interrelated questions. Um, one is from Marvin Centeno, who says, first, thank you for this gem, the solidarity efforts and transformative literature and IR that this book is. He's writing his SRP, and um, it's about IO, or international organizations, IMF, and Latin America. And he says he's outraged that conventional IR literature can't see behind the state as the unit of analysis. Um, and so he's grateful to you, but also just thinking, how can he bring, he says, how can I stay humble and critical as a male Latino, non-Black, non-Indigenous, and demonstrate my anti-neoliberalist solidarity in my research? On a related note, Anonymous asks how the role of white women in context of intersectional feminism. And then Julian Hector, um, he, him says, how do you think students at American University can engage in feminist activism and live by the values that you promote? Okay, I was jotting notes. I think I might have missed something. So the um, conventional IR question, um, I, I think that part of the answer to that is, it, and, and I, I, let me just say that there are professional consequences to my behavior. So I want to, I want to, I want to say that you have to be clear on what you're willing to put at risk. I am willing to put everything at risk um, for a number of reasons. And you know, if, if we had more time, I would talk about that, but, but I, I'm willing to, to put it all on the line. Um, but one of the things that happens too often is that people will speak themselves out of existence. The disciplining process is, is so indoctrinating that they will say, nobody does this, even as they do it. Nobody talks about this, even as they're talking about it. <laughs> so if conventional IR is not serving you, and if all the people who it is not serving talk about something else, write something else, guess what? It no longer is the norm. If <laughs> they're, they're a small group, there'll be some small group of folks to whom it was, it was reson for whom it was resonating, who will be in a room by themselves, and the rest of us in our with our multiple lived experiences, we'll be talking about all the different ways that we live and we survive and we thrive and we organize. Emergent theory, shout out. I mean, I mean emergent strategy, um, shout out to, um, to Adrian Marie Brown. But I mean, I, I think that we have to look at all the different things that are happen happening and not be afraid to cite those things. Whether it's written or spoken or experienced, be bold and cite them. 
here's the caveat. If your plan is to get a traditional IR job, you might not want to do that. I, I can't answer those questions. I have made some decisions that, that I know are going to cost me, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, can, I, I have privileges that allow me to make those decisions. Um, white women and intersectionality. So some of the folks from the Black political scientists have, have challenged white women in I, in IR about using intersectionality in a way that excludes race. And so I think that part of, um, part of what should happen is that people have to really think about using intersectionality in a way that it, that it doesn't exclude the people who are, who are most marginalized by the structure of a, of a particular society. So don't go to India and not talk about caste in, a intersectional <laughs> in your intersectional scholarship. Don't come in the US and not talk about race and, and do intersectionality. I mean, this is, and there, there've been all kinds of questions about, you know, who owns intersectionality and are we, you know, is, have, have black feminists become too attached to it? And I think that we can have some of, some of those conversations, that's fine. And I think that if we look to the spirit behind this work of folks like the Combahee River Collective, you know, formalized in, in, the, in some of the scholarship of, of Kimberly Crenshaw, what we, what we know is that they were trying to do something really specific in terms of identifying harms that were not, not being recognized by the state. And so in the same way, I think that you must invoke an internet, intersectional fr framework in a way that looks at the structures and doesn't exclude the large categories of folks who are most marginalized by the structure and then call it intersectionality. I think that that is, well, it's just disrespectful. All right, <laughs> and then the other, the other one was about uh, feminist activism. How can we in engage feminist activism? So this is, uh, I think it's Elizabeth Spell Spellman, an essential woman, um, I, I think is the text. But there's a, 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 I'm gonna paraphrase, and there's something like, as many different ways as there are to oppress us, we need that many ways to resist. So I can, I can sit here and we can list things together, but part of the reason why I describe myself as a popular educator is because we need to do all the things we can think of and then some, all the different combinations. If anything, this particular moment has highlighted the challenges of, of these structures, these inequitable, discriminatory, racist, patriarchal, classist structures. Do it all. Do, do what you're closest to. Do what you're most passionate about. And then get other people to do what they're most passionate about. We need many solutions. I'm not gonna sit here and give you one thing because I don't want you to take anything off your list. We need it all. We are in dire need. Glad this is being recorded. Um, and so this question from Anonymous, if you don't mind, could you speak more about your experience in the race, gender, and social justice grad seminar with Dr. Watkins? and its impact on not only your intellectual and pedagogical practice, but others with the burgeoning Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at AU, and AU's commitment to diversity, which you brought out Sarah Ahmed, um, and the need to have that be authentic and not just a cop, cop out. And especially with critical race, gender, and cultural studies becoming a department, quick shout out, all their hard work, um, it calls into question why a grad course with such impact that directly tends to these investments has disappeared. And maybe also Dr. Watkins could Offer thoughts. So for me, I mean, it was it was transformative. I mean, for those of you who who read the book, you'll know that I actually end up calling Black feminist anthropologists my family. You know, I'm like we are we are now we are family. You know, um, and again, this is another Dr. Chin will will we'll look at this recording and you know probably shake her head. 
But when I was out in the field, I was in, I was enjoying it so much. And, and because I had had this class with these anthropologists, a lot of them were saying, you know, multiple years. And, and I said, oh, but this, you know, this is so good. I'm getting such rich, rich data. And, um, it, and, you know, anthropologists are known for their, for their thick description. And, um, and she was like, look, if you stay another year, you're an anthropologist. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's not to, it's not to you know, take anything away from that, but just, but just thinking about sort of, you know, how different disciplines con conduct themselves. And so, you know, for me, it was entry into, it gave me permission to do all kinds of things. I, I'm, I'm teaching an, an, an algebra course, um, this, this term to, to folks who are incarcerated and using um, a text that is not an, you know, I'm, I'm using an algebra text in conjunction with Bob Moses' Radical Equations, which, which talks about um, mathematics, community building, and, and, and connects it to, to freedom writing and community building. And so I think that it's, it's great to cross disciplines and not just in ways that reify the boundaries that say that are interdisciplinary, right? So this one is, is talking to that one, but in fact, transdisciplinary, that, that restructures our knowing based on how we decide to use the different, the different pieces of that. And fiction is, is so important understanding people's lives. I mean, it's absolutely critical, especially when you think about who has had historical access to, to publishing as authority figures on people's lives. I mean, think about the structures. And so we find things that, that are really, it, it, it's an untapped archive of, of the historical experiences of marginalized people. And so, um, it, it really, that course started me on, on a new path that, that really has, has shaped my, my career, my trajectory in ways that I, that I could never, um, you know, I, can, I could go on and on and never, and never get through the full list. And I mean, even, I'd love for Dr. Watkins, Watkins to talk more about her work. I mean, but e even when you, when you think, you know, a, a, a biocultural anthropologist, I mean, I mean, it, it just, it already, there's enough in there before you, and then you get it there and there's a, you know, a, a fiction book. It, I mean, it was, it was, it was wonderful. And, you know, it's hard to know exactly how and why again, someone else might want to talk about this from the university, about the institutional structuring of when you have departments, when you have programs, when you have structures, a lot of it ends up having to do with budgetary stuff, which can be interesting. So with that, I will pass it to Dr. Watkins, because I don't know anything else. Don't pass that to me, getting into all that. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, that um, that seminar was... A, a really, really um, important one for me, and I love teaching it, and it was something that I definitely felt like I could pour my whole self um, into. And, you know, I think that in terms of the why and how it went away, I think it's one of those, what do the folks say these days? It's complicated, but I do think that where the university is now is such that the conversations that are taking place, I think punctuated by some of the things that you've said here, will give our department pause and, and make us think about how we might um, restore that. I think that very much so in keeping with, you know, political, or, well, very much so in keeping with um, particular ideological positions, I do know that at one point, um, the majority position was race, gender, and social justice is in everything that we do. So we don't need a concentration. And we kind of understand now that's a very colorblind, um, among other things, blind argument. Um, and, and so when we got rid of the um, seminar, we got rid of classes uh, like that. And it was a class that not only I taught, other people in our department, David Vine, and other folk taught. So um, yeah, I think we're definitely in a space where no one would, would buy that. So we'll probably be looking at that. 
Um, good. It will be a very generative conversation we're having. In addition to having impact in the anthro department, um, this book will also obviously have an impact in SIS. Um, and as someone, I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of ethnographers of empire who are not in IR. Um, and I wanted to ask you about IR, you said in the book, or even just now, that IR can learn from Black feminist radical thought traditions and some of the great work that's happening in geography and sociology and anthropology. But also, um, can people who are social scientists, this book is like an invitation to us to get involved with IR. IR is where power reproduces itself and has all these ripple effects from into the development industry, public and private sectors, wherever our students go out and get employed. So I wanted to ask you about your, your selection of IR among all fields out there. And um, if you are committed to transforming IR as a way of transforming all these other sectors. That's one question. And then our final question is from Johnny Wilson, who says, Dr. Prasad spoke on moving from margin to center, shout out to Bell Hooks. Is center exclusively the access of domination materialized, or is it the internal process of deciding who we are as marginalized people? Also, is critical theory the safe position, the safe school or place for Black women in IR? What other positions are available to Black women? I'm a first year Black identifying female student in SIS. Okay. All right, so th so we all learn and grow. Um, I did. I thought naively that international relations would be international. It had not occurred to me that it would be a U.S. centered, U.S. centric, uh, white patriarchal referendum on the other. Again, assuming my commitment to whiteness and patriarchy. I didn't think that, I, I thought that the international was a note to something else. I, I thought that it was going to be something different than what it was, I, I, you know. And in my experience in studying, studying other subjects in the United States was that often when you study other topics, that it's as if you put US in front of it. So if you do political science, that if you take political science in the US, that you end up being, studying US political science. And so I, it, 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 it was a sort of, it was a disturbing pattern that I thought would be addressed <laughs> by entry into a field that was committed to, to the international. I was wrong. I found out late in the game. You know, like, I don't know, you know, I mean, I didn't, so, so, so I don't, I, 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 cho I chose it naively. That's, that's the most honest answer. And my, my commitments are to, um, are, are, are first to the, the communities that have, have nurtured and loved and cared for me. And I am willing to work with and through multiple disciplines for our justice and our freedom. So, uh, so you know, if it is through IR, if, but, but IR, quite frankly, might have to destroy itself in order to, to tell a more honest story. I don't know. So, so I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know that, that, I'm, that I'm willing to make that commitment, um, but, you know, I, I am committed to, to, to freedom and justice. Um, the, the question about the center, I, I will go back to what I said about multiple mappings. The center means different things in different contexts and to, and to different people. And so we, we can make a decision and, and that we is tricky, right? I mean, I, I could be talking about different groups in that. We can say that it is rooted in a kind of agency. We can say it's rooted in power, structural or otherwise. And I'm saying, however it is we decide to assign it, I'm not convinced that everybody wants it. So I, I'm just saying that I'm not, I'm not advocating for people to be pulled into the center. I am advocating for a reorientation of the map. Oftentimes I'll realize I'll, I'll be fighting for the destruction of a particular hierarchical system. And what I will sometimes find is that a lot of the people in the system don't actually want the system not to exist. They just don't want to be at the bottom of it. 
<laughs> so so they're, they're people who don't want poverty ex to exist. And then there are people who just don't want to be poor. And those are really different kinds of things. And so what I'm saying is that I believe in maps that wouldn't have an easily identifiable center. Now, is that all mappings? No. Are there some centers that people would welcome and embrace? Sure. But I think that we have to also take into account maps that don't have centers. Um, and then the, the, the critical theory um, question. Um, I teach math and computer science and anything else I want to teach. You know I mean? So I don't, there is no one position. I, let's, all of them, take all of them. <laughs> I want you to teach poetry and algebra. I work in a human and organizational development program. Yep. There's so many more questions, but I'm just going to send them to you because we're out of time. But that just means we need to bring you back and it'll be in person after the pandemic and celebrate this book and keep applying and learning from it. So many important wisdoms and insights. So join us all in applauding and thanking Dr. Hall. Thank you all. I so enjoyed this time with you all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. If I can also intervene um, very quickly to our discussion about your book and, and access. So through the American University Library, uh, so for those who are um, you know, affiliated, it is available online now. So you can access it um, if you, 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 know, you can get in through the, the AU system. Um, and also, um, we, this, will, this is being recorded. So I'm actually, I, I now, of course, scraping to find the information. So maybe Garrett, um, my, my co-organizer, do you know for people who do want to disseminate this among their, um, their, their community, their, their students, their, I mean, this is important, especially for, for AU, because you were speaking to us as well as to the larger intellectual community. So um, I think this would be a wonderful resource to, to um, have available. So Garrett, would you have that information? Uh, not right now, but Christiana and I can, we'll send an email out to all the participants with the link to the ebook and then just circulate that if you're in any way affiliated with AU and we'll do our part to keep making sure this gets into the hands of the minds and the conversations far and wide. And the recording for the talk. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate being invited back to my, to my city, although not in person. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hall. Bye. Thank you. Good to see you. Glad to participate in this. <laughs>